is. Keep worshiping the Lord. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy, Father. <clears throat> thank you that you are here, our King Jesus, the healer, our Savior. Thank you. We worship you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here. Thank you. Glory. Hallelujah. Worship you, Father. Mm, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One thing that stood out to me in one of, I think it was a second worship song, has something about that all the promises of God are yes. Hallelujah. I did not know the Bible said that for many years. I always thought it was, you know, yes, if you do good, and no, if you don't, do good. But in 2 Corinthians, it says, but as God is true, our word to you was not yes and no. You know, Apostle Paul didn't come preaching yes and no. Like, goes on to say in 19, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Sylvanius and Timothy, was not yea and nay, or yes or no, but in him, yes. For all the promises of God in him, which is Jesus Christ, are yes and in him, amen. Hallelujah. So don't let anybody tell you any different. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 through 20. Thank you, Father, for your promises. That all your promises are yes and amen. You're not the one holding back, Father. It's us that limits you. Father, open our eyes. I just want to pray this over each of us. That you'd open our eyes, Father, to see where we're limiting you, Father, in our lives. Help us to see it and to repent where we need to. And to receive your truths, Father. Thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, one way we love God is how? By loving one another. Here at Church of the Word, we like to give each other a hug. So grab somebody next to you and give them a hug and welcome them. Good evening, everybody. I, uh, I want to share a little bit. Uh, I don't. I believe this is a, a word from the Lord. Uh, if the shoe, I'll just leave it this way. If the shoe fits, then it fits. You know how you go buy shoes, Dan? You know, uh, you go to the store and you get your size and, 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 and then you put it on and then that shoe's for you, right? Some people will come up to me and they'll say, Pastor, you were preaching right at me. And I'm like, well, does the shoe fit? Does it, did it, did it fit? Like, and, and, it, and I don't sit here trying to think of things like, uh, okay, I see a problem in Dan's life here. Dan's in the second row, so he gets picked on. <coughs> but I see a problem in Dan's life. So now I'm going to preach a sermon and I'm going to pick out a sermon just for Dan. That's witchcraft. That's witchcraft. That's spiritual manipulation. And witchcraft, because I believe Dan can hear from God. I can pray for Dan. I can pray his eyes are open to the truth, but I'm not here trying to preach at him. So when the Lord gives me a word like this, uh, don't sit there and go, well, was that for me? I'm just going to ask you, does the shoe fit? And if it fits, then it was for you. That's how you know that's... That was the shoe you were to buy, right? Don't buy size 5 when you're size 10, right? Um, well, the Lord was dealing with me in worship. Um, he says that there's some people here that are having trouble entering in, and they're having trouble entering into worship because they're critical of the worship. Now, I'm going I'm to say that again. There's some people that are having a hard time entering into worship 
because they're critical of the worship. And as long as you have a critical spirit operating and you're critical of things, God can't get the stuff over to you like he wants to. See, in James, and this is where he took me for scripture, um, a lot of people wait for God to do something. Well, I'm here to tell you that God's not, God's already done what he's going to do. In James, and this is where he took me for scripture, he says, uh, well, I hear people say it this way, and then we'll read the verse, it's chapter 4, verse 10. I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm just waiting uh, for God to, to humble me. Now, actually, God's not going to humble you. James chapter 4, verse 10 says what? Humble yourselves. And see, when we humble ourselves in worship, see, as long as there's criticism and you're being critical, there's never humility. You can't be critical and humble at the same time. You're either one or the other. So if you're in a criticizing space, then you can't get yourself to a place where God, God uh, is wanting to get things over to you during worship. But as long as you, see, you stay critical, he can't. But if you're willing to humble yourself, see, if you're going, well, if it's just the right song, then I would worship. If it's just sung a certain way, then I would worship. No, 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 no. You learn to worship whether it's an on-tune song, off-tune song, just hit the right way, sung the right way, this way, with music, without music. You know, you don't even need music to worship. Right? And if you will stop being critical, God will get things over to you in some amazing ways because that's what he wants to do during worship amen humble yourselves it's not god's not going to humble you is you humbling yourself say i i, I want to be humble right i mean isn't that a christian virtue we want god's not doing it for you it's an act of your will saying, you know what, Lord, I'm here, and I'm going to be humble before you. And it doesn't matter if I don't agree or disagree or like or dislike, I'm going to worship. Now God can get things over to you. Amen? Hallelujah. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up, because God wants to lift you up He's lifted Kim and I out of the dunghill. <laughs> I think it's in Proverbs or Psalms that it talks about that. Um, well, I don't have to look for a place or a platform for, for me to be put on. Uh, I'm, I wait till God puts me there. And when God puts me there, I'm there by his anointing, not by my own devices and plans. Amen? Hallelujah. If the shoe fits, say, glory to God, I found a nice pair of shoes. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I guess we still need to do announcements, don't we? You what? We want to be free to let the Holy Spirit mess things up, not be so strict and rigid and and no, uh, no, it's not time for you to stand up, Pastor. <laughs> but, uh, hallelujah. Anyway, announcements: Monday prayer, twelve to one. I guess still gonna. Yeah, we got Memorial Day. Not Monday. Oh, yeah, so scratch that announcement. No prayer Monday. <laughs> so I guess that's the announcements. No prayer. <laughs> so still Wednesday evening Bible study, 7 p.m.
Wednesday evening Bible study in water baptism. We're going to have a water baptism this spring. I guess we don't have a definite date, do we? It's a in a couple of weeks, kind of based off how many people are interested or if anybody is interested. So awesome. We have people interested. That's awesome. So if you're interested and haven't heard about it, talk with Lene. Praise God. All right. Are y'all ready for the to bring your tithes and offerings? Hallelujah. Woohoo. Thank you, Jesus. You know, we should be all excited about bringing them because that means we have we worked and we have something to bring. You know, God provides so we can bring our tithes and offerings. Hallelujah. Anyway, let's go to Malachi 3.10, the famous tithes message or scripture, I should say. Malachi 3, verse 10. <clears throat> Actually, I'm going to back up here because I just want to point something out that I don't, I mean, because usually when people minister out of this or myself, it's always based, you know, point, looked at a comes from the tithe but if you go back to verse 8 it says you know talking where God says will man rob God yet ye have robbed me but ye say wherein have you robbed me in tithes and offerings not just tithes so when it, you know when it goes on down talks about that he will rebuke the devourer for our sakes this is also connected to offerings not just the tithes oh, it's just kind of fascinating me I don't know if I ever thought about it in that way so so the verse 10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now. So God wants you to prove him. That's what I want to point out too, is that God wants you to prove him. He's challenging you to prove him in the tithes and the offerings. Saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. You know, what fascinates me is this uh comment it says open you the windows of heaven as far as i know the only other place and i'm open to be corrected if you know another place tell me but the only other place it talks about open windows of heaven is when Noah was in the the boat and the windows of heaven open up and the water poured out so that's the type of blessing god wants in your life is a deluge <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what it's kind of, you know, comparing it to. And then we have, uh, you know, in Psalms it talks about his, you know, our cup runneth over. Your surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then we have scripture in, uh, I didn't look this up, but I think it's in Luke, where it says, you know, good measure pressed down and running over shall men give into your bosom connected with your, how you give. So, <clears throat> and then let's go on to verse 11 says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the, fruit, destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So tithers and givers, seed is protected. Even your previous seed that's already in the ground, the harvest that's about to come is protected because of your tithing. Hallelujah. So, that's kind of what I want to encourage you in, is that your tithes or your harvest, expect your harvest. Expect a harvest. We want to raise our expectation, hallelujah, because it's coming and protected. <laughs> so, praise God. That's what I'm going to leave you with. So, if you all would stand up, we're gonna, I'm going to speak over it. Declare a thing. P financial provisions come now. So we decree you begin receiving divine and unexpected financial provision to meet every need. We say that debts and deficits are removed and bills are paid on time every time. We speak that there is financial peace in your life and what has been lacking begins to be filled and supplied. We declare that increase begins to surround your life long term. And we declare a settling of all financial problems and issues. 
we say you receive gainful employment and stable income for your work. In Jesus' name, we bind the enemy's power to create excess breakdowns and repairs causing expenses that rob your resources. We declare financial provision comes now. Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity again to sow into your kingdom, to worship you in this way, Father. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to have a thankful heart, amen? Uh, scripture says, in everything give thanks, not for everything. <laughs> Some people get that little t- kind of turn around and they try to give thanks to God for everything. We well, can't rebuke the enemy if you're thanking the enemy. Can you? If the enemy has brought something into your life, it's a little hard to rebuke the enemy if you're thanking him. So it's in everything give thanks, right? Not for everything give thanks. Do you have something you wanted to share? We're seeing improvement. Amen. It, just for a little backstory, Gabby was having seizures, and so she was okay with us coming down and praying for him. So we prayed for her, and, and um, as soon as we were done praying, I spoke a word to her saying that it will be a gradual healing. And uh, uh, some of it, I, I don't believe God is up there going, okay, I'm only going to release gradual healing. A lot of times it's, it's, it, it's, we have something invested in this. And not more than, that, than I said it, she began to say things with her mouth, which confirmed why uh, uh, I said those things. And, uh, and we've seen it's been a gradual progression of healing in her life. And thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's awesome. And and so it was according to her faith, wasn't it? <laughs> it was according to what she had faith for. And sometimes we're at different levels of faith. November, December, somewhere in there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jesus. That's awesome. That is awesome. Lee, thank you so much for bringing, faithfully bringing the tithe and offering message. Um, I, you know, it's one of the criticisms that I've received is, is uh, we talk too much about offerings and tithes and all that stuff here. And, and Lee's, I believe, been very clear that if you don't have faith for what you're putting in the bucket, please don't give. Because we're not putting a pull on money here. And so I just want to make sure that everybody understands that it's not about pull, putting a pull on money to force people to give. It's about increasing their faith in their giving. And I don't care how many times you've preached the sermon, looked at the Scripture verses, I can increase in my faith in my giving. Amen? And so for me to hear it weekly... And, and, and actually, if you want to get critical, uh, go to Lee and say, how can you stand uh, hearing the tithe message every single week? Because he preaches it. So he hears it before the service, he hears it during the service, and he goes home and hears it again. Has it hurt you, Lee? Has it hurt you? No. I, I don't think it's hurt me either. In fact, it's, it's brought me to a place of understanding. If, if you actually think that you could do without that, then you don't understand the power and, and you, don't, you don't have the faith in it yet. Right? I could hear that message every single day on, on increasing my faith in all my giving. And, and again, it's not just to sit here so that uh, what's the American dream? What's the saying? Um, I, I, uh, uh, it's the three cans. I, I get all I can, I can all I get, and then I sit on my can. I mean, that's kind of what a lot of the American dream is, isn't it? Build up for retirement and then retire and then slowly spend your money until you die. Well, you know what? That's not faith. There's no faith in that. That's all natural, right? 
So we're trying to help build your faith. So not only do you have it for your account in heaven, because Paul even said that, it's, it's for your account. It's for your account in heaven that, uh, that Lee cares about. So, so don't get critical at Lee sharing it every week because he cares about your account. He actually cares about how you represent in this life so that you can um, actually have an inheritance in this life and the next. And Jesus was quite concerned about it. If you actually look up a lot of Jesus' parables, he taught more about money than anything else. Did you ever, did you ever count it? Go look. It up. Get your Bible tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, Sunday morning. Sleep in till you wake up. Get your Bible out. You open that up and you prove me wrong. And you see if Jesus didn't major on money. You know why He did? It's the first thing you work with after you're born again. You, if you don't get that right, you're not going to get anything else right. That's why we focus on that here. Because we want you to get that right. And then, the other things in your life will come out of that. And you'll get a lot of other things correct because you got the money correct. In other words, you're, here, you're not here just, just trying to make a living and getting through life. You're actually here with a purpose. You're here to promote the kingdom. You're here to send people. You're here to give to the needy. You're here to do all those things because God is one, it wants to bless you. He wants to pour out blessing like in Malachi so that you can become a pipeline to other people, not reservoirs. Amen? You're, you're to become pipelines. And, and you'll hear Kim and I say this if you hang out with us a lot. Well, there's more where that came from. Oh, man, I mean, i got to have that deal, and I just can't purchase that unless I get that screaming deal. You know what? There's more where that came from. I don't have to just wait on screaming deals. It's okay to get That's a blessing to get a deal. Uh, Pastor Bob Hawk, Prophet Bob, a lot of you know him, love him dearly. That guy has walked out of reuse it shops with thousand dollar suits and that he paid five dollars. Now he does he has a hard time keeping thousand dollar suits, he just gives it away to the next person he sees. I remember Dale has a story. The Lord ministered to him to give to give uh, Bob his suit, and so he did, and he's just like uh, he's, he did, well, one of the things that he's crying out to the Lord for, at because you know he wasn't necessarily 100% willing right at the first, and he had to get willing. Uh, I'm sure that happens to more people than just me and Dale and preachers. Uh, so he's trying to get himself willing, and he's just like, Lord, Bob's just going to give it away anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That was his reason to not give. Then he realized how silly he sounded, and so he gave it to him. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. We are still working out some of the kinks and some of the details. We did run into a hiccup. Uh, the, the place, we, we are planning on having a landmark here in Colorado uh, this fall. Uh, Apostle Dale, Prophet Bob, and a lot of the uh, Armada people We'll be traveling out here. Uh, we, we thought we had a place set aside. We didn't get a deposit in in time. And, and so it, it now is uh, it's busy that week. So we're trying to keep the same dates so far. It's the first week in October. Um, we're looking at maybe even just renting um, uh, the hotels in, uh, uh, Peggy will love this, in Montrose. And... Um, like the conference rooms and just having it there at the hotel and then people can get a room and, and just even if it comes to that, uh, we're set on having a landmark uh, time here this fall. So it's the first week in October. Um, I don't, I'll get you some more dates as we get a little closer. I'll keep you informed on, on how things happen. But I'm telling you, it, the same thing, Kim and I are getting ready to go uh, in two weeks to the landmark. And it's and Lee and Joyce are gone. It's been a landmark for our lives. It's it's kept us on course. It's kept us in faith. I'm convinced that if I wouldn't have, uh, uh, if we wouldn't have made it made it a priority in our life, we probably wouldn't. We probably would have closed the church 
because it was a high point in our year to get refreshed and renewed. How many need refreshing and renewing? <laughs> we all need it. That's why we get together on a Saturday, right? And is so that we can be refreshed, renewed, and, and charge into next week. And um, we can continue to do what God's asked us to do. He never stops asking us to do things. Amen? So that'll be in October. Also, uh, something else that we've been talking about, and I feel very confident in this. We don't have a slide yet. But um, we've got Father's Day coming up. And um, the Father's date on the calendar, I believe, is... Um, somebody want to help me out on that? 16th or something like that, is that correct? Is it the 16th? It's, it's thereabouts. Okay, so we want to get together as fathers the week after the official Father's Day. Uh, Kim and I are going to be just returning from the landmark on the 16th. Uh, we didn't think it'd be wise on the 15th. Um, and we didn't think it'd be wise to have it then. Uh, I'll just pull it up here on my calendar. But what we want to do, uh, we want a little bit of bonding time for the dads, for the men. Um, I, we're going to open it up to all men. So everybody is okay with knowing how to identify yourself as a man here, right? Okay. I didn't think we had a problem, but just in case anybody did, I was going to help them out after the service. Um, so if you're a man, we would like to, on the 26th is a Sunday morning, we would like to go and uh, have some fellowship time. I'm in May. You know, it would really help if I'd have the correct month. Thank you, Christina. 23rd. So Sunday morning on the 23rd, uh, we would like to go and have uh, play some disc golf. If you don't know what disc golf is, it's, uh, if you want to have a really frustrating day, try golfing. If you're having a perfectly good day and you don't know what to do with your good day, just go golfing. I'm talking real golf and you'll get, become frustrated. <laughs> so, so this is kind of like golf, but a lot simpler. And you, kinda, you have Frisbees, and you end up throwing, so you count kind of like the golf. So I don't believe we'll get as frustrated. I think it'll be time for, for as men to get to know each other, hang out together, talk. And we're going to play Frisbee golf together. And we're going to play down here at the Delta Park. And it's going to be a time of fun, Okay. We're not going to make it overly spiritual or anything like that. It's just a, simply a time to, to bond and get to know each other better and have some fun together. And hopefully it doesn't have any of the frustrations of regular golf. That's, that's, that's my prayer. That it doesn't have any of the frustrations of regular golf and we can actually feel good about ourselves when we look at our scorecard. Amen? <laughs> um, I have tried to golf and I occasionally go golf and... The only way I can golf is um, I was taught this trick a long time ago by an uh, old-time golfer. He's like, you want to hit the ball straight? He's like, put chapstick on your golf head. I'm like, okay. See ball, hit ball, how hard is this? <laughs> so I put, I scrub the face with chapstick, and guess what? It, it works. And I can hit the ball straight. So if you see me hit the ball straight, you know I put chapstick on the golf club. I don't know why it works. It just works. <laughs> but then, but you do have to hit the ball. If you swing and miss, that becomes a moot point. You can have all the chapstick on your golf head you want. And it's not helping you a lick. <laughs> so anyway, for all you bad golfers, that's a little trick for you. I'm sure it's called cheating. <laughs> and maybe we should have a message on cheating. I didn't, it wasn't in any type of tournament that mattered. So, like, some people play for money. And uh, I've, I've played some scramble golf. But anyway, it's been a bit. Tonight, we want to talk, we want to open our Bibles. And we want to look at some scripture. And uh, we're going to look at, um, let's open our Bibles to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 18. Uh, 
Maybe I should have used these verses when I was golfing. I, I should probably golf again, and maybe I could hit the ball a little straighter if I'd talk to it. Proverbs chapter 18. Uh, last week, we kind of got rolling on... Um, I, I preached a sermon on how to change your thinking. And uh, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, having... Uh, sometimes people use excuses. I... I, I uh, you can soon hear what's in the heart of a person if you just hear them out. So if you sit down with them, whether uh, in a meal or playing frisbee golf, you'll begin to, by the end of the day, you'll kind of hear uh, what the person's about. You'll, you'll begin to understand their passions and what they're passionate about. And, um, you know, some people can be super quiet uh, for the uh, longest time and you're not sure what's going on, but you hit just the right subject. I mean, they'll open up, they'll start talking, and you'll know what is in them. And we talked about what's in the heart comes out in abundance. And, and in Proverbs, there's another verse that talks about, as a man thinketh, so is he. And, and we found, uh, science has actually proven, and we found this out in men's class. Uh, we had a men's um, uh, class here several years ago, and they talked a lot about... Um, you know, uh, again, becoming free. And in, in, in this men's class, we talked a lot about freedom and, and purity and different things like that. But they specifically took several chapters talking about how the brain functions. And what you find out is your brain, um, there's brain waves happening in your brain. And, and they actually can uh, analyze this. And as your, uh, the neurons... Uh, a race in your in in your brain in in your um, um, in in your cells, I guess they create pathways that strengthen over time. And so, if somebody's addicted to porn, if somebody's addicted has an addiction problem, most time the word addiction is actually used in a very negative sense, right? We usually say, "Well, that person is addicted." And it's always in the negative. It actually, God designed your brain for that to operate because it can be very positive for you. It's just that the church hasn't talked about it. You can get addicted on things of the Lord. And so what they spent three chapters talking about is how your brain waves have created these pathways that you need to, you need to recognize and break and you got to think differently and you, guess what? You can create new pathways. Now, I'm telling you on, on what we learned as men. Guess what? This works for women too. You can create new pathways in your thinking. If you're stuck in a rut, you know a rut is just uh, an open-ended grave? It just doesn't have the two ends in. Right? That's what a rut is. So, so if you're stuck in a rut, you need to change that rut into something that's good for you. Right? So Proverbs says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Well, that's interesting because God knew a long time ago Guess what? The creator of the universe, he made your brain. So he probably kind of knows how it operates. So if you want to change a habit, you, you, you know, I, I've, I've read books where 21 days to your new habit. Well, what they basically tell you is it takes 21 days to break a habit and to create new ones. And, and, and it's simply processing or it's, it's using the template of you have to create new places, channels for your brain to operate on, right? And, and you create those new channels and then you begin to practice it and you can create a new habit in 21 days, maybe even shorter, right? But at least 21 days you can create a habit because you strengthen those brain waves. And now you have a new rut and hopefully it's not a grave. Hopefully it's not an open-ended grave, right? So this actually should give you hope. See, if, if now, now the sobering, there's, a, there's a sobering side of as a man thinketh, so is he. In other words, the sum total of you right now, you have created by your thinking. 
Maybe you don't like where you're at. Maybe you're scratching your head going, Pastor, I don't, I don't really like who I am. You have created who you are by your thinking. That's actually great news because you can change your thinking and change who you are. Are you with me? It's actually really good news for you. You ought to be jumping out of your chair and going, glory to God, Pastor, thank you for telling me because I can change who I am by my thinking. See, that's why in Romans, let's just go there for a bit. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. So you go home and you make a list of all the things you don't like about yourself. You ever do that? I mean, are you self-aware enough that there actually are things about you that some people don't like? <laughs> we got self-aware people here? Or are you those people that have no awareness? I mean, you're just charging through life. Everybody's going to like me. I don't do nothing that ever, anybody else wouldn't like. I mean, uh, you'll learn this as you travel uh, abroad. Um, here in America, we kind of respect each other's space. And, and you kind of know, generally, when, when you're kind of getting too close to somebody's space. But if you go to other countries, they don't have self-awareness. <laughs> and when they come to talk to you, they come, I mean, they, they come to talk to you. And they don't have awareness. And when, when, when you have a conversation, you have a conversation like this. And, I mean, you can see their yellow teeth. You can, you can smell their breath. You can even feel their heartbeat. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, I'm from America. Can you just back up a bit? Again, no self-awareness. I, I think most of us would say we have at least that awareness. Right? Okay, so maybe you have that awareness, but do you have other awareness? Do you have bad habits you're aware of that you do? If you don't, get out a pencil, start writing them down. You'll figure it out. You're going to have a few. Ask your wife if you're a man. She'll tell you that you've got some very annoying habits. Or, or maybe it's the other way around. Where, ask your husband, he'll tell you. He'll tell you your bad habits. I mean, for crying out loud, can't you finally... The toothpaste roll. Can't you get it that we don't roll it up in this tiny little thing? Thank God my, my wife doesn't do that. But I mean, there's some people that have got to get the last drop of toothpaste out of that because, dear Lord, there is not more toothpaste from where that comes from. Okay? And so we got to get every, I mean, you paid $5 for that toothpaste. Uh, deal and you're going to get every single drop of toothpaste and you scrunch and you roll and you scrunch and you roll and you got this thing all rolled up all the way to the top how about some abundance in your life you know what there's more where that comes from because you can take one silly little principle like that and you can probably look at your life and say you know what i probably don't have a lot of abundance in my life i probably do that somewhere else also, see, sometimes we got to become self-aware, and it's silly little things that that tell us are are telegraphing some things to us of what we actually are in our heart. Are you a Scrooge in your heart, and you got to get the last little bit out, or you're not happy? You're grumpy because you bought a hundred dollar ticket for a concert or a show. And you didn't get what you wanted. And so the next uh, day, everybody hears about how awful the concert was because you didn't get your money's worth. See, then you become difficult to be around. See, these are things, as a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh, so is he. Romans chapter 12, one of the reasons Paul is beseeching you. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. I mean, think about Paul on his knees saying, I beg you. Listen to me, guys. 
by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By how you think. See, your thinking will transform you. See, if, you, if, you're, if you're one of those guys, and I'm not saying necessarily that it's even wrong to curl up uh, the, the toothpaste. I didn't say it's wrong. It, it simply could signal to you that you do that in other areas. See, Kim and I went to a, a leadership conference 20 years ago, and, and there was some things we did in that conference where they said, this is how you play life. And it caused us to watch some things that we do and analyze it because it comes up in other areas. So if you're trying to get the last little bit of toothpaste, you might, you could be, maybe you're not, but you could be, potentially you could scrooge in other areas. And you could really be hard on some people because they're not as scroogey as you. And it could cause marital relationships to, to sour because your wife, because you're probably married to somebody that's flinging toothpaste all over the place. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> chuck it into the, to the trash, we're done, we can buy another one. Right? That's usually how God hooks you up. And, and because you, that's exactly what you need. Because you need to lighten up in life. But well, you know what? When Grandpa went through the Depression, I mean, they didn't have toothpaste. You want to go through the depression? You know what? Grandpa, you know how long the depression was? Long ago the depression was? My grandpa hoarded nuts and bolts because he went through the depression. My dad hoarded nuts and bolts because grandpa went through the depression and it got on me and I tried to hoard nuts and bolts because grandpa went through the depression in 1930. We, would, we are still collecting nuts and bolts. I mean, we had, we went down in what we call the tobacco shed. And, and uh, it was a, a big, big barn, bank barn back in Lancaster County. And um, they used to store tobacco when they raised it. Well, then my, my grandpa got born again, so they stopped raising tobacco. And, uh, but we still called it the tobacco shed. And there was an entry uh, that went kind of down uh, uh, underground, kind of like a mini, or it had lights, or it had uh, windows right at ground level, all the way around. And there was a U-shaped um, countertop all the way around that area. And there was nuts and bolts from everything you could possibly think of that we might need someday. Grandpa collected it. My dad and his siblings collected them. And then my aunt, when she bought the, the whole place, they cleaned it out and threw it all away. So they collected it for? What was the reason they collected it for? So my aunt can trash it. That's why I collected it. They collected it for uh, 60 years so my aunt could get a dumpster in and they could put nuts and bolts into the dumpster by the shovel full. Because that's how they thought. They didn't think in abundance. They thought in scarcity, like we're never going to have a nut and bolt again. And some of you probably have something saved in your barn, in your property, because you might want to use it sometime in the future. And usually this is me. I'll tell Kim, yeah, we want to save that. And so we save it. And then about three years later, we clean house and throw it all away. So we, we, we saved it to throw away three years later. It, it, it's, see, it, it's not that it matters necessarily that you're hoarding nuts and bolts, but somewhere in your life, you're hoarding something you shouldn't be hoarding. And you think it's godly. You think it's your Christian duty. Show me where God hoards things. Or does God give? How does God give? Abundantly. Freely. Constantly. Till the cup overflows. Right? But see, we, because we think that's godly, 
then, then we become that. And it becomes wrong. For as a man thinketh, so is he. That's why we need to constantly transform our thinking by the renewing of our mind. Our thinking needs to be changed. Now, I believe it also goes another step in our thinking. Because we have specific Scripture that does not just say, think like this and you'll be like this, right? There's things, there's steps in this. And so I want to look at that tonight. Let's look at here, go back to Proverbs chapter 28. Part of the reason that um, I have to, I, I didn't grow up a tither. Part of the reason I enjoy uh, Scripture, number one, it, on, on the tithe, number one, it constantly increases my faith in that area. It constantly increases my faith in the area of the tithe. In other words, I constantly, and looking at Scripture, and coming to new levels of believing it. Because you think you believe something, but then you have revelation on the same verse that you thought you believed. How's that possible? You go up another notch and understanding faith rises in you to another level. And, and back to what I said before, if you're critical about the tithe, God will never be able to release the things to you that He wants to because criticism and abundance don't work hand in hand. You'll block it. You'll keep it from happening. And so it's, it's, it, that's why being critical is such a big deal to God. You can, you can point out, some, I'm not saying that you can't point thing, anything out that's wrong, but criticism is where you're constantly chewing on it, constantly talking about it, constantly running somebody down, constantly saying that they're doing it wrong, constantly saying this person had, doesn't have it figured out, constantly, constantly. That's being critical, right? And we're here to lift people up. We're here to speak life to people. We're here to get, even if they have bad qualities, we're here to talk about their good qualities, right? Why are you drawn to a bad quality all the time? Why is that the first thing you see? Why isn't the first thing you see something good about Jared? Huh? Well, why isn't something why isn't the first thing you see something good in a person? Why is it always you see something bad first? Because it actually is signaling to you that there's critical things going on in your heart and you need repentance. You need repentance of being critical and and then you not only do you need repentance, but you got to change your thinking. And, and it's just like uh, I, I was out walking with my boys the other day because we, we, we've been establishing with my uh, two youngest boys that uh, there has to be at least one hour of activity every single day. And it can be a workout. It can be a two or three mile walk. It can be different things. But it ha there has to be exercise every single day. And um, so one of the boys, uh, he began to uh, run the other one down on and and. Well, you're just like this and this and this and this. I said, time out, stop. You're now going to say five good things about the other one, good things, and you're going to speak those things to him. Sometimes us adults would do well with that exercise. You know what? I don't need to listen to the gossip. Time out, stop. Tell me five things about that person that you like. It'll cure you. From being critical. And it's something that not only do we need to do it uh, in our lives, we need to practice this in our lives, it's something we ought to be training our children in. That if they're constantly tearing down their brothers and sisters, they're constantly speaking negative to them, they need to think of good things to say and speak those things out. Proverbs chapter uh, 18, verse 20 says this, A man's stomach shall be satisfied. How? How, how, how is your stomach satisfied? <coughs> how, how again? From the fruit of his mouth. Now, this is not a verse talking about stuffing your mouth with food. Are, are we clear on that? It, it's a lot deeper than just stuffing your mouth with food. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth 
from the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Verse 21. Death and life are what of the, of the tongue? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, I'm not going to turn there, but James talks about this. He says the tongue is like a wildfire. He compares it to... Now, here in Colorado, we know a thing or two about wildfires, don't we? They can be devastating. They can clear a whole mountain. People can't control it. You know, when, when the firemen are fighting the wildfires here in Colorado, um, you, know, you know, they're really not doing a lot. They're, they're like, oh, uh, let's cut a couple trees down and, 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 and get some earth exposed um, and, and, and around the perimeter. And then the wind kicks up and the fire skips their little tiny perimeter and just keeps on burning. And you find out that, I mean, they can't really do a lot. Because, now, now James says that your tongue is like that. James also compares your tongue as the bridle of a horse's mouth. Now, I don't know if you've been around horses or done anything with horses or understand what's going on, but they have what they call uh, different types of bits. And, and um, you can, if, if a horse is well trained, you can use pretty standard straight bits or, or close. Uh, then, then if, uh, again, if a horse is trained really well, but sometimes during the training process and until the horse is trained, they, they can run a, a bit that's got a little uh, uh, kind of what they call a spoon in the bit, and it's just a little, uh, uh, it doesn't go straight across, it comes across, goes down like this, and what that does is it puts a lot of pressure on the tongue or on the back side of the horse's mouth. And if, if you really want to get wicked, you can use what they call a Spanish bridle. And, and that, that little thing, I mean, you can, if you use it too much, the horse is bleeding out of the mouth. And, and he simply compares in James that the tongue is like a bridle. And it tells the horse where to go. Now, you can take a child that knows how to, you know, that, that can be five, six, seven years old, they can ride a 1,200-pound horse and they can tell that horse where to go. They can say, go left, go right. Now, if, it's, if you've got horses like Dan, they're neck-reined. And they just simply, and they're, they're well-trained. We, we rode them last, last July the 4th. Was it last year or the year before? Uh, last year. And I had the privilege of riding them, and, and I was impressed how well they were trained because they were neck rein. Not all horses are, are, are trained for neck rein. You simply have to put the, 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 the uh, you don't even need a, really a bit. You simply need uh, to put the leather on the side of the neck, and it immediately knows where to turn. Well, our tongue ought to become trained like this. Amen? The tongue's also looked at as the rudder of a ship. Now, I've seen some of these ships. You look at some of these cargo ships, and you got an immense ship. We probably right now, in, in all the span of time, they probably have the largest ships built right now than ever before that we know of. And it is guided by a tiny little rudder. And James talks about your tongue being like that, like the rudder. So in other words, your tongue, there's death and life in the power of your tongue. Your life, it says, and those who love it will eat its fruit. In other words, you're going to eat the fruit. Your belly is going to be satisfied by what your tongue is saying. Think about that. Now, when, Hebrew, uh, when Hebrews talked about their belly, they didn't mean their stomach. One of the things with uh, the Hebrew word for belly is uh, really means their innermost being. In, in fact, it's kind of got the idea. It's kind of got the idea of of um, your uh, your soul, and and also uh, in he in the Hebrew world sometimes they combine spirit and soul, and it's really really tough 
to know the difference. And really, the belly referred to, to the spirit of man and his, his soul. See, you have a spirit. Even if you're not born again, you have a spirit. It's dead unto God. It's not alive unto Him. But you have a man made. You have a man's spirit. So that spirit and the soul gets combined into the word belly. So they're not talking about stomach in what food is being processed, but in the very belly of a human. That's your thinking is guided by your tongue. I want you to think about that a little bit. Your thinking becomes guided by your tongue. (coughs) That's why it's important on what we're saying because often we say what we actually are believing. See, people are not, often don't say, to believe or aren't saying in faith to believe, most times people are speaking because that's what they actually believe. So that's why when you hang around people long enough, they start spilling what we call it spilling their guts. What are they? Well, you know, and I even shared last year, uh, last week, uh, I shared about how a lot of times we'll view as a pastor, they'll view me as a priest. And, and I can go to breakfast with people and they'll just start confessing their sins. And in fact, one person, uh, we went to breakfast, he starts confessing his sins and I had to stop him. I said, well, stop. Um, I'm not a priest. Well, he's got to get this off his chest. Well, that, that's, and that's not necessarily wrong, but do you know that you need to talk to God about this issue? Like if you're coming to me just to feel good because I spilled my guts to Lee, Lee's not God. And, and, and I'm not, you don't repent to Lee. You repent to who? God. So if you don't steer people to God, because you're, you're not the in-between. Their relationship is be- between them and God. The re- your, your relationship here at this church does not go from you to the pastor to God. Your relationship and who you're responsible for is for you to God. Now, there's some things of honor. I'm not, I'm not really getting into that. I'm not talking about that. But your specifically, your relationship is between you and the Lord. Part of, and some of you, have it's made you uncomfortable because I have asked you, what is the Lord telling you? Well, Pastor, um, you know, I could do this or I could do that or I could do this over here. What do you think I should do? And and I'm I I pray to God I'm not dumb enough to answer that. Because then you get into manipulation. No, what is the Lord telling you? Now, if if you're completely off track and and you're saying, well, the Lord's telling me to go sin. Okay, time out. We need some correction. (laughs) That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about there's options that are all sound good. I'm not here to tell you. Now, you can at times, there's times of confirmation. I'm not really getting into that. I'm simply going to direct you back to you having a relationship with Jesus. And what is Jesus telling you? Amen? So, your, what's coming out of you is telling us what's in you. Y'all okay with that? What comes out of you tells us what's in you. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, we're a little bit more careful what comes out of us. Because it can tell on us. In other words, your words tattle on you. You know, when you were a kid, you ran to your mom or your dad and said, They tattled on me and they promised, right? Your words tattle on you. Now, we like to dress things up and make them really spiritual. Um, And and I've been around certain people that uh, 
their, their prayer request was really gossip items. But it was disguised as a prayer request. Because, well, well, you know, we should pray for them. But first they told you the story. So it was gossip in parentheses of a prayer request. we got to be smart enough to see that. we got to have discernment in knowing that. And say, so, well, time out. If the Lord brought that up in your spirit to pray for that person, then you ought to be praying for them. Right? You don't need to tell me the story so that I to, to tell me the story and, and disguise it as, well, you can also pray. No, that's just gossip disguised as a prayer request. We gotta have discernment in these things and know these things and understand these things. A man's stomach shall be satisfied, his innermost being, read it this way, a man's innermost being shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. In other words, if you want more peace in your life, if you want more joy in your life, if you want more love in your life, what do you, what do, you do to go about it? If you want more gifts of the Spirit in your life, see, this is the mistake most Christians make. They begin to ask God for these things. Well, Lord, uh, please give me more peace. Lord, please give me more patience. That's the popular one. People pray for patience all the time. No, 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 no. You already have patience. You simply haven't developed in using it. No, God's not going to come down from glory and touch your, 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 your uh, fevered brow and give you more patience. Because Lee, for, I mean, the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit, there's you know what, I forgot to give Lee enough of the fruit of the Spirit, enough of patience when I filled him with my Spirit. I forgot. Now I'm going to give him more patience. No. Lee is to develop more patience in his life. And, one of the, and right here, Proverbs tells you that it comes from the fruit of your mouth. So instead of saying, well, I just don't have patience. See, this is, this is how a lot of people, they, they look into the natural and they see a deficiency in their life. And then they begin to confess the deficiency. Well, I just don't have enough patience. I just don't have enough patience. Lord, give me more patience. Then it turns into a prayer request. And they begin to plead and ask the Lord to give them more patience. No, your eyes need to be opened, according to Ephesians chapter 1, that you already have the inheritance in you that Jesus gave you, and patience is on the inside of you, and you need to have it come out. And it's, it comes out by the fruit of your mouth. You can uh, do it several ways. You can say, you know, I repent for not acting in patience with my children the last 155 times. But moving forward, I'm going to have patience when they act this certain way from now on. Now you're using your mouth piece and it is now the, the rudder. It now becomes the rudder of your life. See, you're saying, I will have more patience in the future when this situation comes up in my life. I will do better. Instead of constantly saying, I'm just a mess up. I've just always been a mess up. My dad's been a mess up. My grandpa's been a mess up. We've been mess ups from the beginning. You stop. See, that's the rudder of your life. And guess what you'll have? Guess what you're going to eat? Guess, what's gonna, guess what your life will produce? Messing up. You'll mess up more than you ever did. See, you've got to change that. There was a time in my life it felt that way. In fact, I, you, know, you, you grow in knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is and, and what, you, what He's given you. And there was a time in my life I was in the prayer line saying, it just feels that I'm cursed. You know, I just have this curse on me. My grandpa was cursed, financially cursed. My grandpa, uh, he was quite wealthy and he lent to his sons and he actually was quite godly in the way he handled it. Uh, the problem was that his sons didn't always know how to produce uh, uh, money 
And so they went into debt, and then they went back to Grandpa and asked for more money, and he gave them more money, so they went into more debt, and they went into more debt till they were servant to the lender, that when Grandpa died, all the sons except one owed the account money so that they could divvy it out. They couldn't even divvy the money out, the inheritance to the kids, because some of the boys owed so much money to Grandpa. And and so my dad and my dad would say things like, Well, I'm never I'm never gonna be wealthy. I refuse to become wealthy because it's a trap and it's a snare. And he would use these things against him. He would use his words, and guess what he never was? He was never wealthy. And then uh, and it come to, uh, it, when he was about 65, he actually inherited and, and, and sold uh, some property where he actually was had a, quite a bit of money. He didn't know how to handle it. He didn't know what to do with it. And it just took a few short years. And they were down to nothing again. Right? Well, you know, my children are here to bail us out. No, no, that's not scriptural. No, no. We're to give. We're to be, we're to give an inheritance to our children's children, aren't we? That's scriptural. We're to help our grandchildren out. So, so these are things that these things affected him. Well, now I got into business, and up to 26 years old, I, everything I touched made money. 20, at 26, we had a huge debacle in life, and and lost everything we had. And, and, and understand that I was, I was trying to get wealthy the natural way. I was trying to get wealthy the wrong way. I was full of pride. I was full of greed. I was full of all kinds of things. I was not spirit-filled at the time. And, and I had to learn how to turn my finances over to the Lord and what the Lord actually wanted. See, I had been trying to build my own empire. And then the Lord began to switch things and show me how I'm to fund the kingdom. And how these things would work. That's why I appreciate the tithe message because it reminds me of what the Lord told me on how we're to help fund the kingdom. And this is what, how we do it through tithes and offerings. If He's blessed us, Kim and I, with a business, we are, we are to, to use that business to fund things in the kingdom constantly. And that way you're constantly using your faith to grow and go to a higher level so that you can do more things in the kingdom and you can fund more things. Not because I'm trying to build my empire. I'm trying to help, I'm trying to help uh, and, and how God designed it, not only laying up treasure in heaven, but get the gospel to the people that are to get the gospel here on earth. I said this a couple weeks ago. Who do you think you are that you get to hear the gospel a thousand times? There's people that have never heard the gospel yet. And you get to sit in church a thousand times hearing the gospel, that's three years. 306, you know, if you're, if you're reading your Bible every day, 365 times three, you heard the gospel three years. Who are you? What made you so special? And there's people that have never heard the gospel. That's why we're here to advance the kingdom of God. That's what we're here for. So it starts with our mouth. Now, let's go to Mark chapter 11. I uh, thought I'd get here sooner. Mark chapter 11. I want to show you some things in here. Now, for all you uh, people that uh, understand hermeneutics, <laughs> so that's a big word for, for religious people sometimes, and how we got it. Hermeneutic simply means contextual. So you have to take things into context. You can't take things out of context. And and funny thing is, um, uh, the, you've shared it the other week in Tithe Message, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A lot of people quote that verse, don't they? How many people have quoted, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? You know that that's in the context, hermeneutics of giving? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So when we're using it for something else, which I believe the Word is there for, to use it in all areas of your life, but you're using it out of context. If you're like, I can do all things through Christ try, uh, trying to get my homework done, you're using it out of the contextual part of it. It's in the con Are you giving money and partnering with somebody when you're trying to do your school? 
No, you're using it out of context if you're using it for your school. But the Word of God still works. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It simply is, isn't used in the contextual part. Well, here, here in Mark, the context of what's happening here in Mark is Jesus speaking to the fig tree. Okay? Now, He didn't go up to the fig tree and start thinking. He didn't go up to the fig tree and cross his legs and start humming. Like the Buddha, like, you know. He didn't go to that special place of, of peace and sitting underneath the fig tree. No. <coughs> he went to the fig tree and he spoke to the fig tree. Now, this is the context of what we're now going to read. Okay? So he speaks to the fig tree. Peter remembering to him, because so the next, and, and he cursed it. He cursed it by saying, you know, he, he didn't curse it as in bleepity bleep 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 fig tree. No, no, no. He cursed, see, 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 religion has it all messed up. They got so much issue with four letter words and how you should not say them, but yet they'll speak doubt and unbelief and it doesn't matter. They'll speak gossip and it doesn't matter, but boy, if you bring a four-letter word to the equation, you're going to hell. Because religion's got it figured out. Actually, that's not what Scripture talks about. Scripture isn't saying um, that it uh, isn't specifically speaking about four-letter words. When Scripture is saying about cleaning up your, your language, it's talking about stop speaking doubt and unbelief and speak faith. So Jesus goes to the fig tree. He doesn't go bleep, 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 fig tree because you don't have any figs. <laughs> he, but He cursed it. Because He said to the fig tree, you're not going to have any more fruit from here on. So He spoke negatively to the fig tree and it was a curse. Do you think if you speak negatively to a person that it's not a curse? Oh, well, that's okay. I can do that. Who said? See, your words matter. They're the rudder. They're the rudder of your life. Well, you know, I'm just, I, I, you know, I'm, just, I'm just telling them about his sin. Well, then you have qualification. If you're actually telling them about his sin, now you've got verses to qualify you. The verses say, to go to get, make sure the plank's out of your own eye, before you go and get the speck out of your brother's eye. Doesn't it? So if you're telling somebody else about the person's sin, what are you doing? Gossiping. So you're sinning, telling other people about their sin. See, gossip has been rated as the okay sin. It's the... It's that adultery, thieving, you know, that other stuff. That's the sins. Gossip's okay. It's not what God says. If you look at who gets thrown into hell, who's there with all the other adulterers? The gossipers. Say, I just may need to repent and change my thinking on gossip. Amen? Amen? And now make some new commitments going forward. I'm not going to gossip about people in the future. I'm going to speak life to them. I'm going to speak good things to them. I'm going to lift them up. I'm going to help them. I want to speak those things to them. Because it matters what we say. So now, we're talking about here in Mark chapter 11. Peter says, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. We, we went over what, how Jesus cursed it. He cursed it by speaking negatively. I just remember uh, when I was like 13 or 14, um, I had a really sour relationship with a cow. I didn't know any of these verses. I didn't understand these verses. But at, at 12 through 14, 15, I had to milk two cows every day by hand. And uh, so this cow, I would curse her routinely. And I'd beat her, and I'd constantly curse her. 
because she was the worst guy on the planet, so I thought. And, I would, and, and so I would have exactly what I said. See, I would continue to say, you decrepit cow. Because, you know, I mean, she would wait until I had a full bucket of milk. And then just like that, she'd lift her foot and plant it right in the middle of that bucket. And I'd have to dump all the milk away. And my mom sent me out there to milk the cow, and at 13, I was expected to come in with a bucket of milk. And so if I didn't come in with a bucket of milk, she's looking at me going, what's the deal? Well, I'd mumble about this stupid cow we have. And I continued to, I stopped milking her to have a stupid, retarded cow, whatever I called her. I'd beat her, I'd speak to her, and I'd continue to have, you know, not one time did she just suddenly turn around and become a great cow. Because I would constantly curse her. But what if I would know? about this. And I'd change my environment by my speaking. You know, you're like, well, Jay, I just don't believe in that stuff. You know, science has been proving this. They have taken bowls of rice and they have played rock music to one bowl and in a matter of days it's full of worms. And they have played Christian music to another bowl and it stays white and perfect for days on end. I don't remember how many days, but reading this, days on end, does not spoil, stays this way. Why? Because God put this principle here on this earth for you to use. You and me to use. And, and we mess it up by cursing at things. And, and speaking negatively to things. That's why it's so important, we talked about several weeks ago, to speak life to your children. You don't, and, and this is even something Kim and I corrected with speaking to your children. If you're constantly correcting them at 2 and 3 and 4, they get the idea that they're always, well, everything's no, 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 no. All you parents know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Seemingly that's all you say. And at the end of the day, you're like, man, I'd like to be positive, but I'm constantly saying no. Well, they're simply learning their boundaries. But as they grow a little older, you're going to begin, you begin to speak to them and you talk to them, what you did is bad. It doesn't make them of itself, in of themselves, bad. But what they continue to do, they pick the wrong choice, right? And you correct them in that way. Because you got kids that grow up with a complex. Their dad told them their, uh, you know, they, 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 their dad or their mom cursed them all their life. And they don't know any better. And they got this terrible uh, self esteem issue and all these things. And the reason is how they were spoken to, right? Okay, so this is the context we're in. We've got to hurry. Jesus answered. So Peter is, look at the fig tree. You cursed it. It has withered away. Jesus answered and said to them, now this is kind of a funny translation in the English. It says, have faith in God. If you look up these words, and I encourage you to go look it up. Don't take my words. Go look it up. There's only three Greek words here. There is no Greek word for the word in. There's three Greek words. Have faith God. Now, if we scramble those words to make it sound appropriately, this should read, have God's kind of faith is what it's trying to say. Have the God faith. Jesus is saying, okay, put it this way. Do you know that an unbeliever often sometimes believes that there's a God or a higher power? So he has faith in God. He's not even a believer. You ever talk to an unbeliever? And, and you, you ask the wrong question, you say, do you, do, you believe there's a God? do you believe in God? And they go, yeah, yeah, I believe there's a higher power or something, something. But I'm an eight, or, you know, it's a, he, he doesn't really have a relationship with you. See, they, they begin to speak those things. He, you know, he's too busy to have a relationship with me or you. But yeah, there's, the, like, there's, there's probably a higher power of some sort. Yeah, I believe that there's that. Well, that, that doesn't give them a relationship, does it? That doesn't mean they're born again. So you can have faith in something, but having their kind of faith is completely different, isn't it? 
Have faith. Have God's faith. Have God's faith. Have faith God. Have faith God. In other words, uh, Hebrews tells us this way. He says, God framed the world with faith. He spoke and it happened. In in, in, uh, Genesis, man was created how? How, how was man created? Well, but, but like, what, what was he created like? Who was he created like? He was created in the image and the likeness of the devil. No, of God. Now, a lot of Christians have this weird complex because they're a worm and they're always sinning. And they, they'll, they'll say these things and guess what they are? What they become. They're always sinning. They feel like they're a worm because they're speaking it. I'm here to tell you, God created man in His likeness and His image. So in other words, man operated the same way God operated. Now I understand that man fell. And so there's some things different there, but there's some principles that have remained the same. As we get born again, we can tap back into those principles. Okay? Okay? For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain... Now, i just seen something today and I'm like, wow. Whoever, whosoever, whosoever, whoever says to this mountain. How many people here are a whoever? And I used to say that, well, that's you. So if you say to the mountain, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say something different this time. You're not a whoever unless you're saying. Whoever... What is this? What's the next word? Thinks. What does it say? Says. So how do you says? How do you says? What? Something's coming out of your mouth that I'm hearing. Now I know Jared said. Right? Jared said that it says. That's what he said. So now I know that it came out of his mouth. I don't know what he's thinking. Jared's looking at me. I mean, I can suppose what he's thinking. I can try to analyze what he's thinking. I can look at his body language and I can pretend I might come up with something that he's thinking, but I don't know what he's thinking. But what comes out of his mouth, now I know what he's thinking. Because now he says, whoever, so it's not just for anybody, it's for whoever says. Whoever says to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. So there's two qualifications. First of all, you've got to say it. Second qualification is there's no doubt in your innermost being. But we found out that our innermost being, our belly, is guided by what we say. Do you see that? Does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says. Who says? You say. That he believes the things. See, here's the problem. You don't believe what you're saying. When you speak negative, you believe that. But when you speak positive, you're still trying to convince yourself. Well, I'm a realist. I had a friend. He'd, he'd always say it that way. Well, I'm a realist. Well, guess what you're going to have? You're not going to walk in God's power. You're not going to have miracles. You're not going to see those things. Because guess what? You're a realist. What would have been the tag Doubting Thomas would have got? What would have been the tag? Doubting Thomas. What, what, what was he? A realist. Doubting Thomas. Go read about Doubting Thomas. How did Jesus handle that? How did Jesus handle Doubting Thomas? Blessed are those that believe and don't see. Right? Doubting Thomas said, I'm not going to believe Jesus rose unless I see. Nails in his hand. I mean, he had all the scientific data. Until I have science, I'm not believing. Unless I see in the natural, I'm not believing. Jesus said, blessed are those that don't see and believe. Okay, so we're back to, but believes, 
that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. What are you going to have? You're going to have what you say. Well, I've preached this sermon before, and I had somebody come up to me, and this is literally what they said. Well, I don't believe that's how that works. So what are they going to have? Because it's working. What are they going to have? They're going to have what they said. I don't believe that that's how it works. So they're going to have exactly that. They don't believe this works, and they're not going to have any mountains removed in their life, are they? Because they don't believe that that's how it works. Now, a lot of people will say, well, Jay, I just don't understand this whole mountain thing, speaking against the mountain. Like, do I really have mountains in my life? Like, Jesus was actually talking about a certain mountain, because He actually was. He actually probably pointed to the mountain. Okay? So, so people that really study this out, you know, He's talking about a mountain, a specific mountain. What, should I just try to, you know, these, these West Elks over here, uh, you know, I don't like that they're there. I'd like to see Denver. Should I just move those mountains out of my life? so I can see all the way into the distance, make it a flat plain. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Move mountains out of my life? Physical mountains? Is that what I'm supposed to do? I mean, that's what you're saying it says. Go to the next verse. Therefore. Now, anytime the word therefore is there, you got to look to see why it's there for. Because it's connecting verse 23 to verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, now Jesus is speaking. So is this red letters? Is Jesus talking? I say to you, whatever things you ask, what's the next phrase? So mountain moving problems in your life are affected, are in when you pray. You can move a mountain in your life by praying. Because Jesus says, the reason that verse, I told you that verse, is so that you hear what I'm saying next. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray. Now we're spiritual, aren't we? I mean, I can maybe see that you're praying. But you're praying to a being I can't see. So we're talking spiritual. Amen? Your praying is your saying. And your saying is your praying. When you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them. And what does it say? Can you remove mountains in your life by asking and praying? Can you remove mountains in your life By asking, believing you have it because you've said it. Can you? Does this mean some, oh, you're some weird mountain moving dude? No. Jesus is bringing that principle of moving a mountain into your prayer life. You have a mountain in your life? How many have problems? Anybody have a problem? Anybody else other than the pastor have a problem? You can change that problem by praying and you pray by your saying. I'll give you a testimony. It's not my testimony. It would be awesome if it would be. This is uh, another pastor. He, had a, he preached a sermon similar to this. He had a gentleman come up to him after the service. He's like, Pastor, i got a problem. It's kind of like confessing your sins to the Pope or the priest, right? So again, this, this, this person begins to confess their sin. And he's going, i got, I, I got a smoking problem. And I mean, I, I smoke uh, 
like two packs of cigarettes every single day, uh, every, like, I don't know, uh, it, it was a, qu a quantity, I don't know the exact amount, but it was a lot of cigarettes. And uh, Pastor Keith, Brother Keith, he looked at the man, and he's like, your problem is what you're saying. See, the, pro the person kept coming up, and said, he said, yeah, but, yeah, but Pastor, I have a problem, it's smoking cigarettes. And the pastor was like, your problem is what you're saying. Yeah, but I have a problem. And it wasn't until about the fourth or fifth time that he kept saying, I have a problem, that the man began to, it dawned on him, well, maybe he shouldn't say what his problem is. See, a lot of times we strengthen the mountain in our life. You know you got a problem, and you keep saying the problem. So you tell your wife, you tell your boss, tell your grandma, tell your sister, tell your brother, tell your uncle, tell your aunt, I got a problem, I got a problem, I got a problem. You just are making the mountain bigger. See, what you got to do is talk. See, go back to uh, verse 23. For assuredly I say to you. Now when Jesus says for assuredly I say to you, He's telling you, I'm t telling you a confounding truth that you're not going to want to believe, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And in King James, it says, verily, verily. But the man that has never lied is saying, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed. So in other words, you speak to the mountain. But, but, but see, we speak to the per another person about the mountain is usually what we do. But that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to speak to the mountains. In other words, so, so as this man is telling Brother Keith how, how um, he, he's got a problem with, he's got an addiction with smoking, uh, Brother Keith told him, finally told him, he said, okay, here's what I want you to say. Every time you light up a cigarette, you say, I'm free. I'm free from this cigarette. This cigarette has no hold on me. And he looked at him, and he, he's got this puzzled look. He goes, but I'm smoking the cigarette. Yeah, yeah. Every time you drag on that cigarette, you say, I'm free. And the man goes, but I'm not free. What does this verse say? Does it say to confess that there's a mountain until there's no mountain? Is that what it says? Does it say, say that there's a mountain... And continue to say that there's a mountain until the mountain leaves. Then you can stop saying it. No. It's saying be removed. So in other words, every time you light up, you got that cigarette in your mouth. This will work not just in cigarettes. This will work in all kinds of lust addictions. This will work in any other addictions you might have. Gossip addictions. Any type of addictions you have. You catch yourself right in the middle of it and you say, you know what? I'm free from that cigarette. That cigarette has no hold on me. That cigarette, I am not addicted to that cigarette. Because that's the rudder that my ship's going. Because, I mean, don't you want to be free? Isn't that the desire to be free? So that's your rudder. Your, your desire is where you want to go. Now your tongue has got to match up. And you're saying, I'm free. I'm free from that. I don't have that addiction anymore. I'm past that addiction. That addiction doesn't have any hold on me. In fact, it's removed. And it's cast out of me. It has zero hold. I'm free. Well, the man's eyes got kind of big and he's like, can't be that easy. Can't be that easy. Pastor Keith? He's like, I'll I, I do a deal with you. You do that for three weeks. And you come back and you tell me how, I did, how it's going. Three weeks later, he's like, Brother Keith's like, I could see it because I could see him come in the back of the church and I could see the bounce in his step. I could see the smile on his face. I could see it all over him. He goes, Pastor, I'm free. I don't have any desire for cigarettes. He's like, brother, tell me how it happened. 
He's like, I took a break from work. <laughs> I mean, any cigarette smoker has multiple breaks. If I'd get as many breaks as a cigarette smoker, probably wouldn't. Get, I mean, you just every excuse you got to because you got to go light it up, right? Well, the thing about having to go light it up every five minutes because you have this desire gave him opportunity to speak to it every five minutes. So it was a good thing. So he goes, yep, I'm lighting it up, taking every break I can, every time I'm taking a drag, saying I'm free. I'm free from this. This mountain's cast into the sea. I'm not addicted to this in the name of Jesus. I take authority over this. I am free. And he's like, one day, <laughs> I lit up that cigarette. And he's like, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at it. And I look at it. And I realize I don't need it. I have no desire. He's like, it's lit, but I have no desire to smoke it. He's like, I have tried to stop and quit. Pack. He's like, I'd buy a pack, you know, and you'd smoke three out of the pack and throw the pack. And then you'd buy another pack. I mean, it's the most uh, expensive cigarettes in the world, right? Because you're, you're, you're trying to stop. And he's like, I looked at that lit cigarette and I realized. I don't need it. I'm free. I don't need it in my life. He's like, I threw it away. I haven't had a desire for cigarettes since. This is your ticket. What I'm talking to you tonight is your ticket to freedom. And if you sit here and go, yeah, well, I just don't believe it works like that. That's your problem. It's working for you in reverse because you don't believe it. It's funny how people don't believe that I haven't tried it. I've always marveled at that. The people that come against the tithe don't tithe. <laughs> oh, that tithe is under the law. Have you ever t tried it? Nope. Not going to either. You know, they're ready to fight. It's like, well then... Let me tell you, uh, I actually am an authority in this because I have not tithed in my life and then I've tithed in my life. And I can tell the difference. It's also, they, they do the same thing with speaking in tongues. It's like speaking in tongues are, is for you. You get filled with the Spirit. You can receive the baptism of the Spirit and you can speak in other tongues. Nope. It's just for certain people. How do you know? How do you know? And, and, and because there was a time in my life I didn't speak in tongues. And then there was a time in my life where I did speak in tongues. I can tell the difference. I'm actually the authority in the matter. If you didn't and you don't, then you only got half on one side. So you're not in authority. If you're sitting here going, that doesn't work for me. I don't believe what you're saying. You're not in authority. You haven't tried it. I have. This has worked for me. I've received freedom from this. Multiple areas. Multiple mountains removed. Multiple things seen, removed from, just, just gone and being more free in my life. And if you're saying, well, that doesn't work for me, I'm here to tell you, it's working. You're refusing to allow it to work. Well, I just don't believe I have to say stuff like you're saying. Well, then, stay the way you are. If you like, you know, it's, it's a little like uh, you need an awakening, kind of like the, 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 the younger son, you know, it says that one day he realized he's in the pig pen. He kind of had an awakening going, wow, I don't like where I'm at. I'm going to go back to where I came from. And you simply need an awakening going, hey, you know what? If this is in the Bible and Jesus said it, maybe I should take a look at it. Maybe I should take a look at it. Maybe I should apply it in my life. Try it for 30 days. Come back to me in 30 days and let me know if it's not worked for you. Because there are things that can block things. And we're not, we don't have time to get into it tonight. There are things that can block things from happening. Jesus even speaks to it in the very next verse. 
Amen? I'm telling you, your mountain, can, you can be delivered from things in your life. If you, have, if you think you've just arrived in everything, well then, you, you can grow in faith tonight and, and come to a higher level of faith in this area. If there's nothing wrong with you, if you have some self-awareness and have been talking to Jesus, you probably are aware of a few things in your life you'd like to have changed. Here's your ticket to change it. Here's your ticket to change. Well, it can't be that simple, Pastor. Don't I have to do something? Don't I have to grovel? Don't I have to... No, 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 no. His grace is sufficient for you. It's, it'll take care of the problem. The grace is power, and it's enough power to help you in this. It's sufficient. It's enough. His power is enough for you to get to the next step. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Well, I've preached myself happy. I know that I've, there's several areas in my life I can brush up on, go to a higher level in, and, and in, my, in what I'm saying, what I'm talking about, even when things are staring me in the face in the natural, I can continue to speak God's Word over it. And there's some more Scripture verses that we're going to go to. But I believe that this is your ticket to live a completely free life. Hallelujah. Father, we thank You for each person here tonight. We thank You that You've actually put this principle in place. That the tongue is like a rudder. The tongue is like a bridle. It bridles the whole body. <laughs> it bridles the whole body. It steers the body. Your, the tongue does that. That's what Your Word says in James. And Father, this principle of speaking to the mountain, Jesus actually said, speak to the mountain. Then He said, therefore, do this while you're praying. So He brings it into our prayer life. And Father, I'm th I thank You for this principle because it means that if there's things that we come up against, we can change our circumstance. We can change what's going on. There's no longer a no-fault religion in me. It's, there's no longer, well, I can't help it in me. There's no longer a victim mentality in me. I'm free from being a victim. I'm free from being, having victim mentality operating in my, my life. There's always responsibility. I have a responsibility to You, Lord. And these mountains, I have a responsibility to speak to them. And Father, anybody here and under the sound of my voice that wants to become free in areas in their life, that You would allow them to see, open their eyes fully to this principle that they can speak to their problem. Not tell everybody about their problem, but speak to their problem in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Amen, Amen. I truly believe there's going to be people that are going to leave here tonight and put this principle into practice and they're going to see freedom. I truly believe that. If that's you, please let me know. Please let me know that, hey, you know what, Pastor, I've been doing this and I'm free. I'm free in areas in my life I wasn't free before. I want to know because I, I, I am your cheerleader. <laughs> I'm your cheerleader. This is not just a pastor message and only work for the pastor. This works for anybody that says. Anybody that opens their mouth and speaks to their problem. You tell your problem how big your God is. Amen? Hallelujah. You have a great weekend. You have an extra day to your weekend. Memorial Day, and uh, enjoy your Memorial Day uh, vacation or whatever it is, and we'll see you Wednesday night.